Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Welcome to the Wasteland, my weekly show where I talk about whatever the hell I want. And continuing a new series of classic reviews that I've been doing, I have my very, very good friend here, Haley, to talk about Guy Ritchie's Snatch, which I remember seeing this for the first time because of Haley and encouraging the film. So Haley, thank you so much for coming on. It's a special moment when I get to tell Shane about a movie that I love as much as I love this movie, and then getting to experience it along with him. I mean, like, I don't get to do it often, but when it happens, it's very special for me. <laughs> and this is a special episode because we're doing this in person, thanks to my birthday and the holidays lighting up very nicely. Thanks Thanksgiving for being a week after my birthday. But... For those who don't know, Guy Ritchie is a British filmmaker who became very famous, especially earlier in his career, for making British, like, street-level gangster movies with Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, uh, wound up going on and kind of coming back to that feeling with The Gentleman that he came out with. Also kind of was going for that again with his most recent film, which unfortunately got shelved because it happened to have Ukrainian gangster villains in it. And they're like, well, this is probably not a good time to release this film, and it just <laughs> magically disappeared off the release schedule. But, you know, most people might know him actually from his Sherlock Holmes films, which he did with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law, and he also did the Aladdin, and he's actually going to be doing the live-action remake of Hercules, too. Oh, so, like see, interesting. He also is married to Madonna, which some of you might just know him from that. But, Snatch, we have this street-level gangster film, and right at the center of it we have our two pals, Turkish and Tommy, who are caught up in a whole entire web of ridiculous, convoluted, crazy betting on, like, bare-knuckle fighting and all kinds of stuff. And so we have the unscrupulous boxing promoters, violent bookmakers, a Russian gangster, incompetent amateur robbers, and supposedly Jewish jewelers fight to track down a priceless stolen diamond. And that is Snatch in a nutshell and definitely an over oversimplification of all the ridiculousness that is this film. But Haley, why did you want to come on and talk about Snatch? I mean, there are so many reasons why this movie is special to me, but I feel like one of the big ones is, like, this... What Guy Ritchie does when he's really in his element, and, like, this is probably his best movie, mm -hmm. probably will always be his best movie, is create something where you are you sit down, and from the moment the movie starts until the moment the movie ends, it's just going. Yeah. And somehow... Everything is accounted for. Like, it's confusing, especially the first time you watch it, it can be a lot. But, like, there aren't really many loose ends in this movie. And it just goes, 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 goes. And it does not stop. And it's funny. It's funny from mm -hmm. start to finish. Everyone in the movie is on point, as far as I'm concerned. Like, it's just a... To me, it's nearly a perfect movie. Um... I would say some of the some of the language that's used in there doesn't age well. There are a couple things that, like, you know, as I've gotten older, I've been like, maybe don't do that. But, you know, really just always a special thing to get to experience. I never get tired of watching it. Which, like, the, the whole entire atmosphere around Guy Ritchie films, for the most part, especially, like, his early street-level gangster stuff, is, like, it's very macho. It's mm -hmm. a bunch of dudes... It doing different kinds of crime and all kinds of stuff like that. They talk to each other in a very specific way. Yeah. Like, um, Rock and Roll is one of his other films, too, and, like, there's a whole entire thing in that movie about Tom Hardy's character being gay and everything, and it's just, like, it's, it's it definitely of its time. time. And to be honest, it's probably very reflective of how a lot of men in this kind of, you know class cultural area do act in that way and I do think that it's pretty accurate yeah. on like with the way that they interact with each other you might need subtitles sometimes you should absolutely put on subtitles for this 
Um, I do that for everybody. I'm like, I don't care if English is your first language or not, you will need subtitles. Also, you don't want to miss what Brad Pitt is saying. Yeah. But to your point too, I another thing I kind of like about this movie that also makes me feel like it, it all works even in some of the like little cringy moments, no one in this movie is a good person. No. no there is not a blessed person in this movie who is a good person. And it's just a matter of like, who you personally root for, but, mm -hmm. like, no one's good. Everyone is a terrible person. Well, and that's what I like about Lock, Stock, Two Smoke and Barrels. What I like about this, rock and roll it to extent. I didn't love that one, but mm -hmm. I did enjoy it. And mm -hmm. I love The Gentleman is... Yeah. They're all bad. Everyone's bad. They're all criminals. Mm -hmm. But there's a level of code yes. within them. And, like, you see that a lot in The Gentleman because, you know, like... You have Matthew McConaughey's character definitely has a code mm -hmm. and lives by. And then the, the extent of how bad people are is how lacking of a code and honor that they have. Mm -hmm. Like, within, it's the same thing of, like, you know, it might be an odd comparison, but in many ways it's like a Western out in the middle of nowhere. And there's, everybody's not doing great things for the most part, but there's certain level to, like, who do you attach to? Because, you know, Turkish and Tommy aren't the best guys. They're not all above board <laughs> with what they're trying to do here. Absolutely but not. But they're trying or to... Gorgeous George. <laughs> Gorgeous George. <laughs> and they're just trying to figure things out. And what I like about this is, like, there's so many characters. And it's such a nice range, specifically in this film, of up-and-coming actors. That mm -hmm. really got some breakout roles in Guy Ritchie films. You have very, very specific British character actors that fit their roles perfectly. And you might never see this person ever again in anything else. But they're there. And then this one in particular has a little dash of star power right at the center of it with Brad Pitt. Oh, yeah. Which him as a, um, like this Irishman, this this like gang of gypsies and they have their trailer park it's and essentially everything. Trailer trash <laughs> yeah. meets Britain. <laughs> yeah. And the way they interact with each other and just you know, like you like dags? You like dags? Like dags. It's for me ma. It's for me, for me ma. <laughs> and the thing is like Brad Pitt's amazing in this and Brad Pitt, I will argue with anybody, is better when he's being weird. Oh, like, 100%. Because, like, he has all those, like, regular leading man roles, but, like, when he's being weird, like, in 12 Monkeys and Snatch, mm -hmm. and, like, when he gets that chance to be a weird character, because, like, at this point, he already had, he was in 12 Monkeys, he was in 7. He This was fresh off of Fight Club. Because, mm -hmm. like, that was 99, this is 2000, so, like, Brad Pitt's at a pretty big point in his career at this rate, and he just comes in with this ridiculous... Irish accent that you could barely understand half the things that he's saying, and he's basically one punch man. And I feel like what you were saying earlier about the idea of the code, like, mm -hmm. it's really interesting in this movie specifically, I think, that you've got this structure, and, like, everyone's playing by the rules, both, like, hypothetically and literally, except Brad Pitt's character. Nope. Yep. And it's almost like you take this situation, and if Brad Pitt's character wasn't in it, it would have all played out in a very different way. But his character is, and the fact that he and these folks are like, we're not part of this. Like, we're, like, geographically we're separated from all of you. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, like, how we do things, you just have to keep up because we're doing it our own way. And in the end, like, they're always going to be one step ahead. And I love how that's also very disruptive to how you... Like, you know, you're struggling as you go through watching this the first time, like, where is this going? And then it turns out that these guys, who are depicted as kind of, like, the least educated, the least, like, with it, end up being the ones who... <laughs> Swindle all of them. Right. Well, and you get that from the very start when they sell them that one trailer, and it I won't work. <laughs> the one caravan is just like, no, nah, it doesn't work. Yeah. And all the games that they play with them, they're so, they're so clever. And they play on the fact that people don't take them seriously. Can't understand them. <laughs> and can't understand them. And, you know, you have this whole situation because they are the outsiders. Because mm -hmm. they're not... So, like, 
they're the outsiders of the outsiders because Guy Ritchie films are about outsiders. Right. Like, all these British gangsters are not within the acceptable society of, like, Great Britain. Like, these aren't, like, posh Londoners. It's like, these are a bunch of, like, scrape the bottom, bottom of the barrel bunch of uh, small-time criminals. And even, like, the crime bosses aren't, like, these aren't, like, big wealthy, influential people in, like, the government of the UK. It's like, no, it's just, like, in their little circles, they're king. Mm -hmm. And you have, like you said, Brad Pitt's character and this whole group of outsiders of the outsiders coming in, and he's a wild card. And just right. shakes it all up, because what fun would the movie be if it didn't have that shaking it all up? And that's one of the great things about Guy Ritchie films. It's like, you have you have all the setup. Yeah. Fast-talking voiceover at the beginning setting all these characters up and then it's the end which it's like always last 20 minutes of them trying to pull all the threads and like untangle it all and you're all just like wait wait a minute yeah <laughs> how it all played out and i feel like this is probably the best version of that absolutely and that's what guy Ritchie does when he's at his best is something like this and this is the best version of that so arguably, yeah, this is his best film when you take that step back and really think about, like, this is how it all plays out. But, you know, you have Jason Statham, who, this is Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, and this were pre-The Transporter, mm -hmm. pre-Italian Job. Like, this was not that action star Jason Statham. It's a small guy with a little bit of hair, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> a little bit of hair, and he's like, the Germans. The Germans. <laughs> the Germans. And yeah, him... Tommy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Tommy. And uh, just, it's Jason Statham, and he's having a lot of fun. Like, it's so interesting because you watch these two films, and then I recently watched The One with mm. Jet Li and Jason Statham from 2001 for my podcast with my friend Rowan. He was terrible in it. Like... You could tell the director had no idea what to do with Jason Statham in this movie. But the thing is, like, Guy Ritchie knows exactly what to do with Jason Statham. And that's what I love about Guy Ritchie. Is, like, he finds certain frequencies for actors. And some actors have never been better than how they were in Guy Ritchie films. I would think Jason Statham definitely is that case. Like, even in Wrath of Man that came out very recently, too. Like, mm -hmm. Jason Statham's great in that, too. Yeah. Um, the way that he makes the most out of Charlie Hunnam and, my God, Hugh Grant and The Gentleman is ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> and, like, he just finds that frequency with people. Yeah, and I also love, in this movie especially, I mean, the cast of characters, you know, like, the actors is impressive, especially looking back, but mm -hmm. also, you know, the... He has done this in other movies, but I think this is his, like, most successful range of just these, again, like, characters. Like, yep. every person in this movie swings for the fences. Yep. No one's, like, taking it easy. All of these people are just ridiculous. And and that's really what lends, you know, like, every time this the scene switches... You're like, okay, now what? But everyone's funny, and this whole thing, every <laughs> like, I just think about, uh, what's his name, Boris, the, the Russian guy? Yes. <laughs> Who's got all these guns, and it's just like, you know, in the beginning, they mention, like, oh, like, he can't die, and you're like, okay, but then they bring that back later, yep. and it's just, that's my favorite scene, <laughs> they keep yeah. shooting him. Uh, Boris the Blade, which... <laughs> Uh, Raid Serbija, who is, like, this character actor who's popped up, like, he was in Eyes Wide Shut the year before this and stuff like that. Like, he's even, like, the that one random homeless guy in Batman Begins that he gives the jacket to. Oh. Like. <laughs> I didn't know that. He, he's an interesting character actor. He pops up in this and is a star. And so funny. just looking through, like, the cast, like, um... I don't remember the actor's name who plays Bricktop. Uh, Bricktop Alan, is incredible. Alan Ford. Like, you'll probably never see Alan Ford in anything else, but in this movie, he's king. Like, he just steals every single scene, and he's so great. And you have people like, um, like Jason Fleming, who got his start in Guy Ritchie films before he popped up in other things. Like, him and his... Uh, 
my god, that mullet that he has. He's one of the Irish people. Yeah, yeah. Brad Pitt, just yeah. like... Because, like, Jason Fleming wound up being in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He was in X-Men First Class. But, like, he's always at his best when he's running in one of these Guy Ritchie films. Or even, he was it with... The actor played Tommy, Stephen Graham, mm -hmm. who has gone on to, like, he was in The Irishman and got to act against Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. He was in Boardwalk Empire. Mm -hmm. And he's such a great actor. And he was just in a film called Boiling Point with Jason Fleming. And it's just, like, so many really strong British actors, like, pop up in Guy Ritchie films and really got their start in them. And because he gives every single character a chance to breathe yeah. and get to have fun. Right. Like, this movie even has Benicio Del Toro in it, randomly. <laughs> like, why is he in this? Why does he dress up as a Jewish person? <laughs> the beginning is very confusing. I will yeah. give you that. But once you get what's going on, it just is... I mean, obviously the, the, the characters are well played out. You understand everyone and where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. But then... Something else I was thinking about just, you know, contemplating this movie, knowing we were going to talk about it, is I feel like this movie, you know, it's it's your typical, like, like mobster thing, but at the same time, there are experimental elements to this. The soundtrack, I think, really complements it. Mm -hmm. And some of the songs from this soundtrack will get stuck in my head, like, randomly. Um, and I think it really kind of, like, enhances the movie where it's not just like scenes of people doing mob stuff there are these like experimental scenes like when brad pitt is like knocked unconscious and like it's like he's falling in the water mm -hmm. like he didn't have to do that but things like that or even mm -hmm. that dog chasing the rabbit and how it's more emblematic of like things happening in the movie like there are those little moments like that too which take this from being just like a a fun movie with really good actors, but it kind of raises it even a little higher to something mm -hmm. where there are experimental things that are being brought in visually that took some, like, insight. And, again, I, knowing that this is only Guy Ritchie's, like, second legit movie, yeah. I mean, he did not pull his punch with this at all. Mm -mm. And you could tell, like, Locked Stock and Two Smoking Barrels was kind of, like, the rough draft. <laughs> a, yeah, a trying out period. And, you know, it's mo most of the core, like, you know, Jason, Fle uh, you have Jason Fleming, you have Jason Statham, Stephen Graham, Vinnie Jones. Mm -hmm. Vinnie Jones has never been better than in a Guy Ritchie movie. And, like, him being the juggernaut in, like, the X-Men movies and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like, Vinnie Jones is great in Guy Ritchie movies. And they, it's that kind of thing where it's just, like, I appreciate you bringing up the music because if you watch a Guy Ritchie film, it's always a very unique auditory experience because, like, it never really sounds like how you would expect it to sound. Right. Like, you watch the his Sherlock Holmes films. Mm -hmm. What are those scores like? Mm -hmm. They're like these, like, weird, like, um... I can't even trying to think of what instruments they're using, but like they sound so off and weird. They're like strange sounding, like organ and piano music, like playing along and like creaking and cranking and stuff like that. And it evokes an emotion. It's not yeah. just them saying like, "Okay, create a score for a, a mobster movie." It's create a score that makes you feel X way. Yeah, and have you seen his King Arthur movie? Did which one was that? King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, with Charlie Hunnam in it. I don't think I did. And Jude Law's like the evil king. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my god, he hams it up so hard in that. <laughs> but like, the music in that is when hard. Mm. Like, Daniel Pemberton, who did the score for that movie, I'm like, this is like an amazing score for this ridiculous $170 million King Arthur movie. I'm like, who greenlit this? <laughs> Uh, like, who thought this was a good idea? But like, the Sometimes music's it amazing, like that. and you can always feel the stamp of Guy Ritchie. There's even a scene in that movie where Charlie Hunnam's King Arthur, and he's interacting with Robert. Oh, uh, I forget what his full uh, like his actual is like his last name is. He's an actor. He was in Game of Thrones. He was uh, Roos Bolton, mm, and yeah, 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 yeah. they're just doing the whole like Charlie Charlie Hunnam is 
telling the story and like going back and forth and doing that whole entire Guy Ritchie thing where right. it's like telling a story within a story. The fast and the, talking. The <laughs> fast talking back and forth, quick <laughs> editing. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like the this is an hour and forty minute movie, just constantly going like that. I feel like it's a half an hour. <laughs> yep. The high energy, fast editing works perfect. There's just an. This is just a roller coaster ride of absurdity from start to finish. And the cast is great. Guy Ritchie. There's a very specific style to his films. And when he's doing it right, they're amazing. And he gives plenty of substance. Because there's such a compelling and interesting and crazy crime story here. Right. With so many twists and turns. And all the characters are amazing. And it all just feels like it's flowing in the right direction. And... You know, I feel like something like this is really hard to make work. Like, you know, you could have a very standard, specific story, you know, like a romantic comedy and people just play the beats. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, at least some people enjoy this because they just enjoy a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. This is this is not a film where you're just like, let's just hit the beats and it should work. No, you trying to balance all this stuff is insane and somehow he pulls it all together because i appreciate at the beginning you said there's no loose threads here this is so easy to have like 50 million oh, loose threads at the end where you're just like but what about that see bullet what train about that? yeah that we just were talking about it's yeah. like that's a fun movie too but don't think about it too hard like a, yeah, a cause... joy to watch but don't think about it this movie you can watch it over and over and over it's all there it's all accounted for like there's mm -hmm. nothing that gets like that's super, oh, I don't know about that. Like, I, I believe all of it. Like, Guy Ritchie's, like, the first shot of the film hits that domino. Mm -hmm. And the, you have this ridiculous domino set up, like, taking up a whole entire room. Yep. And by the time the final domino lands, you're just like, wow, how did that work? It yeah. just does. And it did. And it hits all the beats, and it's so much fun. Something else that I was thinking about with this movie, too, is... It's, you know, it's a mobster movie. There's violence in it, but, you know, there's not a lot of blood. It's not a bloody movie. It's, I think it's palatable for more people. And I because, appreciate like, a movie that doesn't feel like it has to revel in gore, even though it's obviously about, like, a lot of people die in the movie. Like, it could have easily had. It could have been a bloodbath Tarantino situation, but instead it was very, like, they... You knew, like, when people died and when they didn't, but there's this kind of, like, funny awkwardness to, like, looking at someone who's not on the screen, <laughs> like with Boris, or even Tony, uh, uh, Bullet Tooth Tony. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, there's that, like, off-screen thing that they do that I, I feel like on the one hand it helps them not needing to, like, worry about, like, the budget of showing, like, someone with bullet wounds, but... It also just had it adds to the charm of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I feel like you can show this movie to people who are a little squeamish and, you know, like, topic-wise, they don't hold back with things. But it's not actually a bloody movie, despite how much, like, violence happens. Yeah, because, like, it's rated R for strong violence, strong language, yes, and nudity. There's... So, like, it's still, like, an adult film, but, like, it's something that is just, like, it's creative. Yes. And... It's not creative showing somebody getting riddled with 50 million bullets and just blood everywhere. Like, it's clever being able to play off it. And that's the thing. Guy Ritchie films are always awkward. And that's some of the beauty of them. I love that. Is, like, Guy Ritchie violence is awkward. Coen Brothers violence, awkward. Yeah, yeah. Like, things don't play out like they should. <laughs> ever. And that's the fun in it. Because, like, how are all these characters going to be resourceful to try to figure it out afterwards? Because they have to be, because otherwise they're going to be shit out of luck. Because what the hell are you supposed to do? So it's definitely one of those things where it's just, like, it is a crazy, crazy ride to go on. And, you know, I want to see more films like this from Guy Ritchie. And, like... Not that I don't want to see him make millions and millions of dollars by doing Disney movies and stuff like that, but, like, do I need a Guy Ritchie Hercules adaptation? No. Do I need more of this? Yes. Like, I need more of this in my life. 
I know, and I think he just does so much better when, again, like, you don't need to worry about this, like, moral, uh, like, overarching moral thing. Yeah. Like, with Aladdin, with Hercules, even to an extent with Sherlock Holmes, these are characters who already exist, who we're familiar with, and they're mm -hmm. supposed to have this certain moral compass. And the great thing about these movies, when he, like, does a great job with The Gentleman, this movie, Lock, Sock, um, Two Smoking Barrels, Everyone, again, like I said it early on, like everyone's kind of a terrible person and that gives you a little bit of wiggle room. But it's also like you get to create these crazy characters and you get to sort of, like they are the dominoes and then you start hitting them, but you know the trajectory of where all this stuff is going to go and it's yeah. all within his control and within his imagination. And I just think he's really good at that and it's delightful. And I'm not, I have nothing against him playing to his strengths. Mm -hmm and giving us more of these movies, because they're just fun. <laughs> well, and his new film that was supposed to be coming out looked a lot like this kind of energy. Just so too soon. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they're going to do, like, reshoots of it and change some stuff up, or just Make them kinda, Russian. Or kind of just... <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> just, like, wait it out. Yeah. Um, but, like... Even with like Wrath of Man, that was even a little bit different because that, that kind of different. that kind of stripped away the humor. Absolutely. But was still like that street level kind of criminal kind of story, but um, you know, and that's the biggest thing. I think one of the thing about Aladdin is like I don't think he knew what to do with the character Aladdin because like the character Aladdin's too one dimensional kind of like he's a good he's a good kid That's and thing. everybody just thinks he's a street rat right. but like you don't have to you don't have a whole lot of creativity what he did with Sherlock Holmes though he went out of his way to make yeah. him like really leaning into the weird quirky craziness mm -hmm. and like obviously yeah. Robert Downey Jr. was a hundred percent up for the challenge and went with this Those it. two that was a good match yeah, yeah. but like I agree when he's dealing with the morally gray, he's so much better. And this movie's just all gray. Absolutely. <laughs> there's no there's no good, there's no bad. It's just like who on the scale of here to here is going to be the worst and we need to figure out which one's the lightest shade of gray to be like, yeah, we're in their corner, <laughs> but enjoying the whole ride along with them. I feel like in this in this movie, the person who had the only person, I think, who had, it seems, like, any moral compass at all was Bullet Tooth Tony because he did not want to kill a dog. <laughs> He's yep. a good man when it comes to animals. Not people. Not people. No, absolutely not. People don't get that decency. No. But don't you dare kill a dog. <laughs> what do you mean? Open him up. <laughs> <laughs> Which even like even thinking about <laughs> even thinking about like the gentleman, you have um, Matthew McConaughey's wife. Yeah. And I feel like she's levels him out, even though like she winds up holding her own at one point. That's the thing. She too, can definitely hold her own. Which also, you're not gonna go in one of these movies and see a whole lot of female characters. Uh, <laughs> We were just having this conversation about Lord of the Rings. Just be like, how many female characters are actually in this trilogy? But, like, you look at a Guy Ritchie movie and it's like, not a whole lot of, like, strong, interesting female characters. The strongest female leads in this movie are Mickey's mom. Yep. Who has a great smile and is adorable, um, but mainly just a plot device. Mm -hmm. And then the woman at the bookies who's like, I said, all bets are off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's it. That's all you get. <laughs> yeah, like, honestly, one of the strongest women that I think he ever put in any of his movies was Jasmine. Which which is interesting, because she wasn't a strong character in the original animated movie, and he actually made her a self-reliant, independent character. I feel like he got character. it. She's got a pet tiger. That's got to say something about you as a person. Yeah, there you go. Seems pretty cool to me. Um... <laughs> I'm, wait, I'm waiting for him to make a musical version of one of his gangster movies oh after God. he made Aladdin. I wish he... I hope he doesn't, but, you know, it's to each their own. If Disney will pay for it, I guess we'll find out. But, Haley, do you have anything else that you wanted to talk about in regards to Snatch? Uh, I just think it's, it's this thing that you, you know, 
what like you either are like looking for it or you're not but for what it is it's the best mm -hmm. and i have yet to see anything that does more than basically make you think eh, that was kind of like snatch only not as good yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if you have not seen this movie and you like just some chaotic fun i mean you can't miss it what tarantino did for independent talky movies like with pulp fiction yeah snatch did for like street level gangster movies because like you'll see plenty of movies like you know what that felt like a guy richie movie was the snatch yeah. so <laughs> there you go but Haley, thank you so much for coming on and chatting one of your favorite movies with me it was something that i will do again and again anyone who ever wants to talk about snatch i'm always here for it and if Guy Ritchie ever gets picked for Welcome to the Wasteland, you know who's going to be coming on for this episode. 100%. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> she already has it. Written in stone. But thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland reviewer.